it was unquestionably uh, a miracle in the sense that it's what I needed because I came out of that going, yeah, I'm going to pay a little more attention to this Course in Miracles thing and stick with it. Mm -hmm. um, I had two other really um, quite astounding miracles after that. And I do want to share them because I think when, when miracles are coming, not just extensions of love from us or uh, remember, they're also about saving time. So I could have rejected the course and come to it 20 years later, in which case we wouldn't all be sitting here doing this. Or maybe we would, but from a different angle. Um, they save time. So that was the first. The second miracle, just to be very quick, I was at a ski lodge um, where uh, John and Tam were with their father, but I wasn't in a hotel room. I was down in the dormitories, which at that time of the year were deserted. I was the only one in them. And I had what we call the Criswell edition of the course. It was a little paperback. They printed them in yellow, white, and blue. Um, and uh, I was reading this. I was in the text, very early part. I really, you know, this was probably a month after um, the episode in the church. And this janitor comes in and he's sweeping and he asks me, what am I reading? And I wasn't going to tell him it's A Course in Miracles and Jesus brought it in through uh, an atheistic psychologist at Columbia. So I said, you know, it's, it's a book about the mind. And we had some kind of a very banal, innocuous chat that I don't remember a word of. But then he turned around and at the door, he sort of looked at me and he said, all I know is all real pleasure comes from doing God's will. And he left. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh my God, he was a religious fanatic. I'm so glad that I you know, stopped talking to him when I did. And I went back to the text and started reading. And the very next sentence where I'd left off said, all real pleasure comes from doing God's will. <laughs> I love yeah. that. Yeah. I love that. Again, it rocked me. But here's the point I want to make. Yeah. There was no fear in it whatsoever. It right. didn't shake my world. It shook it enough to say, this is non-ordinary. This cannot happen in a world of cause and effect, yes. uh, as the ego would teach us. Yes. Um, again, it, it was a further confirmation that I was on the right path. Yes. And then the third one, um, which may be my favorite of the lot, because it has very little to do with the Courts and Miracles, but everything to do with how time is an illusion and how the Holy Spirit can manipulate time in such a way, uh, if we allow it, that, that again, things that might not happen or that might take a great deal of time to happen, uh, just work out. So you wouldn't know it to look at me now, but um, while I was in college and medical school, I was a huge fan of a band called The Grateful Dead. I was a deadhead. We okay. would get tickets. You, you're familiar. Yeah. Into them. Yes. <laughs> no, okay. Yes. <laughs> in my first year of medical school in Philadelphia, the dead were coming to town. They played at the big ice rink, the Spectrum. And one of my friends had bought the tickets. And, um, and a bunch of my high school friends were coming in because I grew up in Jersey. And, you know, they were crossing the river and uh, we were all going to have a fine old time except that the guy who had the tickets wasn't in his dorm. He wasn't anywhere to be found. And, uh, you know, so figure this was 77. We didn't have cell phones. You know, there was no way to reach him. And I truly was at my wit's end. I thought, well, maybe I'll just drive to the ice rink and park. And, you know, maybe we'll just all fan out and try to find this guy. And then at a certain point, I realized that's absolutely nuts. I, I just need to ask for help. I pulled the car over to the side on Arch and 17th. I remember it well. I closed my eyes. I said, help, I really need a miracle. And as I'm sitting there with my eyes closed, um, there's a knocking on my car window. And I'm like, oh shit, it's probably the cops. And I open my eyes and it is my friend with the tickets, holding them in his hand, waving them at me. And I am just totally blown away because how can this happen? And I said, what, where did you come from? And he said, oh, we were driving the other way. We were headed back. I saw you in your car sitting there. I don't know what you were doing, but I figured I'd give you your tickets. So, God wanted you to go to the concert. I'm <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah for that. It was a really God is a Grateful show. Dead fan. Yes. 
and, and in particular a Jerry Garcia fan. Um, right. But I bring these up because we each have our own path and we get what we need on that path. I needed to be shown in some very concrete ways at that point that this was something I was supposed to stick with. And, um, and although I don't, I probably haven't had things happen of that scale, uh, although, you know, Judy certainly has had more than her share. And I have a few of those I relate in uh, my first book, um, the one about um, Exodus, uh, which goes into miracles, not just from a course perspective, but looking at them in some other ways, because Exodus is all about miracles. Uh, but you get what you need and you don't get what you don't need. There have yes. been other points in my life where I'm like, oh, I'd really love one of those miracles again. Boy, wouldn't that be great? Well, right. that's my ego talking. You know, I don't need them now. I don't need them now. Um, right. You get the messages in different ways. So uh, Judy's husband, Bill Whitson, sometime around 2005, asked me if I would have any interest in basically taking over the foundation when they were deceased. Um, at the time, I was very into my screenwriting. It was going pretty well. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, no, no, not interested in the least. Happy to stay on the board. Not my gig, not my thing. Thank you very much. Uh, and yet here I am. What happened? Well, I had basically gone on sabbatical from the course for a few years. Uh, and doing the screenwriting was very compelling. I was writing spiritual scripts. And yet, Every time we had not just a nibble, real serious interest. I mean, I had a, an agent at Creative Artists who was their premier television guy um, peddling uh, a, a TV series where I'd written a pilot about a psychiatric unit and all the people in it and the crazy patients who come through. You know, it was working, except it never did, never did, never did. That was a miracle. I didn't recognize it as such at the time. I kept wondering, why isn't this working? It wasn't working because it wasn't supposed to work. It wasn't yeah. my path. Yeah. And what I would leave us all with here mm -hmm. is sometimes if you are pursuing something that you are certain is right, but the Red Sea isn't parting for you and you're getting obstacle after obstacle, consider that it might be the right path only to teach you the lesson that there's some egoic block here that you need to haul up out of the darkness of your unconscious and really take a serious look at ultimately to offer it to the Holy Spirit for reinterpretation in love. Um, because that's what I have found. You know, when I'm going off track, it's like I hit those little speed bumps on the side of the road and, you know, my life starts going thud, 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 and I need to get it back on track. Um, on the other hand, sometimes, boy, it's, it's just, you know, it's like the path lights up uh, and you didn't even ask for that. Uh, so that's kind of the, 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 uh, the Cliff Notes version of how, of my story and how I got where I am. I mean, there were other beautiful things. Oh yeah, okay, I'll give you another example. So my senior year of medical school, I'd arranged things to have three months off and travel around the world. You could, through Pan Am Airlines, you could travel in one direction as long as you flew standby. And I was meeting Judy's son, John, who was flying in the other direction. He was going through India. and We were going to meet on, in, in Auckland, New Zealand at the airport. But if that didn't work, then we'd try to meet in Sydney, Australia. Again, no cell phones. We, we forget. Um, anyway, we met. We were you know, hitchhiked down to the South Island of New Zealand and hiked up a very steep trail. My second day out on a flat part of the trail, I slip on a rock. I hear this crack. I know it's my leg. I know as a senior medical student, this is not a good thing. Three, four days go by. We run out of food. We're begging for food from other campers. Um, and uh, finally, they airlift us out. And I have to give up on this trip that, I mean, I, you know, I, I'd written to people to stay with all around the world in Bangkok and Delhi. And I had to beat a retreat to California. But I had all this time off and I no way I was going to head back to Philadelphia and just sit around and do nothing. So I stayed in California. Well, guess what? That's when Bill Thetford was living there. Um, Jerry Jampolsky hosted a Course in Miracles reading every morning that Bill would attend, Bob Scutch sometimes. So for a month, I got to go to these um, hobbling on my cast. 
uh, I was already a pretty darn serious student of the course and probably knew it uh, as well as you know anyone other than Bill or Ken uh, at that time. Um, I'm trying to think if Helen had died yet. Yeah, Helen had just died recently that, uh, or, or when we were out. Anyway, it was another example of what I call a plague becoming a miracle. And here in this time of plague that we're living in, I think the best response is expect miracles, look for miracles. They may not come, they probably won't come in the way that you expect. Mm -hmm. But some, they're, they're, you know, when we turn it over to the Holy Spirit, we will have a lesson in love of some kind. That is inevitable. That is guaranteed. You know, right. your, your, your journey reminds me of that Zen story. It reminds me of that Zen story about, you know, the guy who um, who's, goes out to get more horses and they, they get oh, more yes. horses and some people say, this is good news. And he's like, maybe it's good and maybe it's bad. Right. You know? and then the horse breaks his kid's leg and then he can't go to print war and maybe it's good and maybe it's bad. And it's exactly. like, it just feels like that, you know, and this is, this chapter is like, like that for us. I mean, we don't know anything. And yet, like I read in the very beginning, like a happy ending is insured. So like hold tight to that and look for miracles. What are miracles? Extensions of love that require no sacrifice. So just, you know, remember we're here to extend love, not to try and get, get, get. You know, the law of attraction has gotten us only so far. And now this is the law yes, of exactly. to extend. And we get to like, we get to apply it to our life. Like, how would we know we had it if we weren't in this hour? You know, because I know I'm like, I'm getting itchy for like toilet paper and like certain sandwiches. Oh. That I, <laughs> I mean, like, and it's like, okay, like I got special relationships and, and it's just a really, I mean, d being on the backdrop of this, I think it really makes the lessons pop. And, th I, and I think that that's beautiful. It's beautiful to get close to the bone and say like, is this, are we really living this? Or is it just something yes. we read every morning? So, so you know, um, the opposite of love is fear, but what is all encompassing can have no opposite. You know, you're choosing one or the other, at every moment you're making all your decisions with one teacher or the other at every moment nothing in the world of form is bigger or smaller or lesser or greater or more dangerous or less dangerous than anything else so here we are in this plague and we aren't used to plagues you know this isn't like the 14th century with the black death or anything like that so it feels very scary notice <clears throat> the, the the tricky little ego manipulations that happen we're now afraid of our brothers because we're afraid that their bodies can attack us <clears throat> without even it being an attack, just by touching us or touching something that we then touch. It's kind of the ultimate indictment of the physical body. So um, for me, no, you don't have to go around loving and hugging everyone to prove that you're immune from the virus because that's also an ego ploy, uh, unless you're extremely guided to do that, and I don't know why you would be. On the other hand, I think that as teachers of peace and love, and we all are, um, it's our job to hold that, that inner space of love, mm -hmm. of peace, of guidance, that can only come when, as you said, Maureen, when we know we don't know anything. Yeah. Uh, I have a little um, sticker on my microwave that says, when I realized nothing makes sense, it all started to make sense. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Which you know, I love. I, it is interesting because a lot of, you know, a lot of circles, like co coaching so circles will ask, like, how is this for you? And the question that I came up with recently, that just came to my mind was like, really, how is this from me? Like, how did I need to bring this in so that I could learn something? I was talking about like, oh, I am a bringer of peace, so I'm gonna go out and hug everyone because oh, yeah. basically I'm special, I'm, I'm right. different. The virus won't touch me, I'm, I'm blessed right. by Christ or whatever. That's her. I wanted to hear a little bit about Bill Thetford, but we'll get to that if we get to yeah. it. But does anybody have a question? You, can you know, we can do this again too. While mm -hmm. I sit by, uh, it looks like scotch, but it's actually iced tea. <laughs> Yeah. Sorry. Our Grateful Dead days are over. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Grateful live now. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I, any substance, I mean, I certainly consumed my share of them uh, at one time. 
A, I don't need them. B, I feel like they just knock me off my center now. Um, they're not enjoyable. I, you know, I mean, I can go places in a, with one course lesson that I couldn't access with the, the best asset on the planet, you know, 35 years ago or something. So, you know, you get to a point where you no longer need the intermediary. Um, but that serves its purpose too. Um, I know a group out here uh, who, older, uh, and where several of the members were very devoted course students and they'd never had a mystical experience and they they knew someone in their group who could per obtain LSD. I'm talking like, I don't know, this must have been late 1980s. Mm -hmm. And they did these guided trips and they were very, very profound. If you know, we get what we need. We don't get what we don't need. Yeah, and, and I guess if it comes with a hangover for you, then you might want to question that. Yes. There are people who can drink coffee all night and day and they're good to go. And there's other people who can't. Um, you know, I did have an experience with <clears throat> psychedelics and um, it was awesome, but I also felt like I'm trying to microwave my evolution. And I just, and I really got the message of like, what do you, like, just slow down, you know, go at the pace of peace. If there's a cost to anything, it's, for me, it's not worth it because everything should be unbidden and easy. You know, yeah. so when you talk about your unbidden examples of miracles, I, I think that's what shows us that we're on course. You yes. know, like, am I trying to, am I trying to rush to something? Do I want to get there first? Like, I don't, you know, I don't know. I have to question all of my, um, and, and if it's right for someone else, it's right for somebody else. It's just my own personal journey. Well, that that's why we, it's so important to be in touch with inner guidance because, you know, the ego is so clever and devious and will tell you you're doing it wrong or you're doing it better than anyone else on the planet. Um, you know, specialness and grievance, guilt uh, and arrogance, they're, they're just all different faces of the same coin. Um, so, you know, you have to trust uh, your inner guidance. Uh, that, that's, that's what it comes down to um, every single time. Yeah, you know, I used to drink a lot, you know, and <laughs> I've been in 12-step for a while. And, um, you know, what I went back out to, to just to prove that I was, you know, holy and could handle it. And I'm still allergic. But um, the day I found that I was still allergic, <clears throat> I had drank with my sisters, you know, and we, we drank like there was like no end to it. And um, then I woke up the next morning and I was supposed to be on this Course in Miracles call. And I, I overslept and I was like throbbing, like my hangovers were huge. And I like crawled my ass to the, to the book. I open it and the lesson is I will not harm myself again today. Oh, I and love it. I know. And I was like, oh yeah, that's right. I won't. You know, like, I can't do this. Yeah. I love to use that line in regards to forgiveness, too. Like, when people go through the forgiveness process or anything that we're hung up or strung out about, like, to, to tag that on, like, I want to let this go. I want to let my brother go. And I don't want to repeat this because I will not harm myself again with this thought. Because I am notorious for apparently picking shit back up. <laughs> uh, you're so unique. I can't believe it. Um... <laughs> Do people have questions? I mean, I can certainly share a little about Bill, or if you have specific questions about Bill. Um, I love the man very much. We had uh, a very um, instant connection. Uh, one of the one of those ones where you just know I know this person, um, and you don't even have to talk about it. Uh, but um, I'd rather take questions from any and all of you. Does anybody have any questions? You can just raise your hand, your little green hand. I saw myself raise my hand and I thought that was somebody raising their hand. That's how <laughs> it can be. That's a powerful <laughs> lesson. We're all one. <laughs> uh, Audrey, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Hi, Audrey. I just met Audrey on Wednesday. <laughs> oh, good. Oh, that's so nice. Oh, I Thank did you, have, Audrey. <laughs> I did have a little question. Um, if you... I did want to talk about healing during our time together. Mm -hmm. um, healing, and when we talk about healing, you know, like there's the healing of the body, there's the healing of the mind, there's the healing of the relationships. And um, I know you work with relationships. 
Um, but uh, so yeah, could you just speak to us a little bit about healing and what might be some helpful tools to stay um, vibrant during this time of this backdrop of sure. disease? I, I think you know the most important thing is to recognize, as I said it early on, that the course it's one clear truth that gets repeated over and over in all of these variations and forms. So healing, salvation, atonement, forgiveness, Christ's vision, they're all talking about the exact same thing, more or less, with certain different um, perspectives on them. When the Course talks about healing, there's only one healing that's relevant. And it doesn't have anything to do with these things we think we live in called bodies. It can, but that's not what it's ever about. It, it, it's always about healing the mind because the mind is the cause and the body is the effect. Hold on, I'm getting a spam call that I just need to get rid of. Um, so when it talks about healing, it's healing the split mind. It's, it's healing the illusion that you are different that we are all different, that we are in these different places, that we have these different bodies and life stories, and reminding us that at the level of the Christ, which is our true self, capital S, we're, we're one. Spirit is one. You know, it can't be divided and chopped and sliced and diced. We think we can do that, but we can't. So all healing is at the level of the mind. That said, and this goes back to you get what you need and you don't get what you don't need. For some, healing of the body can be very, very important. Um, I got a question on one of my recent webinars. I'm now doing um, webinars through the foundation, um, trying to do at least once a month. Uh, I think in April I'll do two. And the question was about from a woman who had um, apparently very bad eczema, skin condition, um, had a dream where I think, I, I don't remember exactly, but Jesus came to her and she woke up and the eczema was gone. Uh, very powerful. But she had another condition, a chronic health condition, and that one didn't go away. And she was kind of wondering, well, you know, how come one and not the other? And the implicit you know, question she was asking is, what am I doing wrong? Um, my wife has had many chronic illnesses over the years, and I've watched her go through that process of of sort of piling on the guilt of because my body is ill, I must be doing something wrong. I think that if we look at the way um, Bill and Helen each chose to pass on, we'll get examples of the two different ways that we can do that. Helen was not a course student. She was completely clear and could bring the course's teachings through like that when she was in that, that state of mind. Otherwise, she was hostage to the ego, she was fearful, she was jealous, she was angry. Um, she died of, I think it was pancreatic cancer. She was furious at everyone on the West Coast who had abandoned her in her mind except for Ken. It wasn't a pleasant way to go. Bill, on the other hand. Sounds fun. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> Object lesson, folks. Uh, don't do it that way. Bill, on the other hand, had really moved to a place where, um, you know, he was doing, um, I think it's fourth step work. You know, he was reaching out to everyone in his life who he thought might ever have been caused harm or a grievance by him. He was engaged to a woman who he broke off the engagement because he knew he was gay and, and couldn't go through with a marriage. But he never told her. She was wondering, you know, he reached out to her, told her the whole story. Um, they cried. They became close friends. And at a certain point, Bill told everyone, he, I mean, it, it's a, a multiple pun, and Bill was a punster to leave all punsters behind. But he said to Judy, I'm flexible. Um, well, flexible was one of the uh, scales in his personality assessment system that was the paramount thing that he and Helen developed psychologically for basically measuring the ego. I mean, it's so ironic that they measured the ego and then they brought the course in. Um, it's also a pun on flexi-bill. Um, bill was now flexi-bill, you know, I think of like a Gumby doll. Things weren't touching him. Um, he wasn't rigid anymore. And he came back to visit uh, Judy on July 
for a July 4th get together with all of the friends because he'd lived in Tiburon for years uh, up here in Northern California. And, uh, you know, Judy said, I got to go to the store to pop, buy a few things. You want to come with me? He said, I'll walk down and meet you there. But if I don't, don't worry. And so she took off. He leaves. He gets, I don't know how many feet. He's in front of the neighbor's house and he falls over dead. Um, what they said is his heart literally blew open. I think of the Grinch here, uh, but Bill was no Grinch. He had done all the work. There was no reason for him to stay. I don't recall whether I was told this or whether I imagined it, but I'm sure he was lying there with a smile on his face because he'd completed. No more reason to stay in a body. Those yeah. are our, our choices. So back to healing, when we try to tell the Holy Spirit how he should heal us, um, we're being arrogant. We're pretending that we know better than he does. And there are people who will be healed by getting coronavirus. We don't know their path, but they will be. It'll do something for them that they, if they act on it, if they take it in, will bring them someplace that they couldn't have gotten to without it. There will be other people who are terrified of it, where um, maybe it, it, it shuts them down or closes them off. <clears throat> we don't know shit um, to be crude about it. And the more we understand that, the wiser we get, and the more we can turn to the one who not only does know uh, shit, but knows everything, and then things get orchestrated in ways that help. But all healing is of the mind. That's the only place we need the healing, but we don't do it very well for ourselves. You know, that's where we really need the help. Hmm. Yeah, you know, okay, so this is an odd, ex another odd story I have for you. <clears throat> so Good. <laughs> I was on the set, I was talking to my daughter recently. She, she, she came home to be with us and she was nervous about the coronavirus and being by herself. And so she's, she's staying with us. And I, I was saying to her, you know, it has a lot to do with your mindset. Like you, if you have a wholly healed mind and you don't in, introduce fear into a situation, you can override this. And I said, and I told her this story about once I was on the set and uh, it was like my first commercial that I ever booked. And the director, it was two directors. And the one director was really mean and she kept yelling at me, but I was so happy to be there. I didn't actually hear her. And people would come up and like do my makeup and move my hair around and they'd say, um, don't listen to her, she's a bitch. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> who are they talking about? Like, I didn't know, like I didn't, I wasn't connecting it. I was just so fucking happy to be in on the set of a commercial because this is what I really wanted to do. So I said to her, not only that, but I picked up the soda can. I was supposed to drink it and then look at the camera and say, this is fantastic. I picked up the soda oh. can and I drink it. And in my mouth, it, there's a bee in my mouth. It got in the can and it went in my mouth. And I was like, mm, what's going on? And I opened my mouth and the bee flew out and they got it on camera. Oh and my God. And I said to my daughter, I truly believe I was so happy that a bee couldn't even sting me from the inside out. So yeah. I don't know if I'm just feeding my daughter bullshit. <laughs> or, no, that's Ramdas. Be here now. Mm -hmm. Yes, but, and but you you put it in your mouth. That's all. Yeah, <laughs> be here in my mouth now. Yeah. <laughs> all right, grow. Yeah, but but so so the diet is really love. The diet is really joy. The diet is really knowing that a happy ending is ensured. The diet is really not judging anyone, not going into resentment, not going into comparison. Like that's a really, that's a really strict diet. Yeah, let me just like bend it a little bit. It's not not doing it, it's having the intention not to do it. And when we do it, because we will, you know, we're here, we're still here, we're still egos uh, to some extent. When we do, becoming as aware of it as possible and then becoming as willing to release it as fast as possible. You know, when, back to Bill Thetford, when someone asked him, um, how do you know if you're making progress in A Course in Miracles? His answer was, how, 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 how um, long does it take you to release a grievance? I think that's a very good metric. I really do. Because when you're really doing this stuff, you get it instantly. It's like your state of peace is just gone. And that's not a good feeling. It feels lousy. 
um, you know, oh, I, what happened to my piece? I want to get it back. Um, oh, yeah, that happened. And those grievances, you know, um, in my latest book, uh, From Loving One to One Love, which I held up, um, I talk about what I call micro grievances. I'm borrowing from the uh, culture warriors and their microaggressions. But micro grievances are those seemingly teeny tiny little judgments that we make all the time about our partners, about our kids, about that a-hole who was driving on the freeway and drifted from the lane, whatever it is. Each one of those pulls us out of peace and gives us an opportunity to, um, to choose once again and release it. So yes, you're right. We have the intention not, you know, to be on that. Uh, it's really not a strict diet. It's an open diet. It, it's you can eat anything you want as long as it's real. And the only thing that's real is love. So as long as you're eating love, uh, then yeah, that <laughs> then then the being works. Um, but uh, but I, you know, we do fall off. We fall off all the time. That's how we learn. Because if there's one thing I know from my psychotherapy practice, you can't cure shame by feeling shame about it. You can't cure guilt by feeling more guilty about it. Uh, and that's one of the ego's best tools. You know, it comes in and it piles on and it tells you you didn't do it right. And how many years have you been doing A Course in Miracles? Shouldn't you know better by now? Oh yeah, Just, that's, you know, a, that's a fun question to ask yourself. Yeah. <laughs> For me especially. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that's really good. I mean, that's really good info that the diet is love and that we can, we can't overfeed ourselves on love. No. <clears throat> we get exactly what we need when we need it. Uh, you know, when I was writing about the book of Exodus, you know, the Hebrew Bible doesn't have much about forgiveness or love in it. I think there were tough times, um, but it did really nail how miracles operate, at least as I can see it. And sort of the final miracle of the Hebrews after they leave uh, the bondage of Egypt, which is a mental place. I mean, even the Hebrew word for Egypt, Mitzrayim, means a tight, narrow, constricted place. Isn't that a perfect description of the ego mind? A tight, narrow, constricted place? So anyway, even after they leave, what miracle do they get for 40 years? Mana, mana in the wilderness. You know, this, this stuff appears when every morning and all they have to do is gather it. What do they do with it? They grumble, they gripe, they wish they were in Egypt where they had so much better food. Well, the Talmudic scholars said mana will take the form of whatever you need in any given moment. I mean, the joke was, you know, if you need it to taste like chicken, it'll be like chicken. Um, we get what we need in every given moment. This is a really hard one to learn. I would much rather have, you know, $5 million in the bank that I'm earning interest off of than noticing that wow, I actually have been able to pay my mortgage every month, um, even when it looked like that might be tough. How'd that happen? That's mm -hmm. mana. It comes to us in the present moment. Uh, it, it's all we need. So we drink of love, trusting that we get what we need to sustain us in the present moment. Um, but that's not easy for the ego that wants to live in the past and the future. And will take us there all the time. And when we see it, all we have to do is say, Thank you. I'm going to choose once again. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, what it makes me think of is like when a seed drops into the soil, because we're at spring now and we talked about this, the idea well spring. of wellspring, that the seed drops into the soil and it's dark in the dirt. You know what I mean? And then the, and then the shell cracks open and the, probably all of us think, hold on to the shell. Like that has protected you for so long. Don't grow past this moment because this is, you know, the comfort zone that we know. And so it's that, it's that crossing the threshold of change, you know? So that's kind of what we're constantly in is crossing the threshold of change. And the thing that lives on the other side of the door that we haven't opened yet. And that's, you know, so that can be uncomfortable for all of us. You know, and, we're, and, and it feels like right now we're in a universal classroom of all of us going, we don't know what's on the other side of the door. We don't know who will be. It feels like a classroom of renewal where literally things are going to have to go down to, to blank canvas in order for us to restructure the things that are, you know, I think we created some of these structures to be helpful and they ended up being harmful. And yeah. so, you know, so they, so they, they, they will implode. I mean, that's just sort of what happens. 
Yeah, I mean, if not you to want to, not to take us to the deep end on the last five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Now we're all gonna die. <laughs> Which I mean, we're all gonna die. I just mean like certain structures and agreements and classifications yeah. that are just not working for us, and there's no way to dismantle it into, unless we just clear it. Yeah. Well, I always go back to that line in the course that tells us that the separated are always afraid of change because their first experience of change was the separation. So every time change comes in. We have this deep, you know, core atavistic fear of, oh my God, we're doing it again. Um, and that's where it's so key to follow the guidance of our inner teacher rather than the guidance of, you know, the, the, the little voice that, that tells you it knows what's going on. Because when we do that, then the miracles happen. Then we get the proof that we were on the right track. But yeah, I mean, quite honestly, I remember, because um, I was a big fan of uh, Esther Hicks and Jerry uh, back uh, around 9-11, mm -hmm. uh, and I had this way of just running into their conferences everywhere. It was kind of amazing. I remember being out here in San Rafael visiting from New Jersey, and I get on the elevator at the uh, embassy suites, and Esther and Jerry Hicks are standing there. I'm like, say what? <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, but I remember um, Abraham, the Abraham Channel saying, look, about 9-11, uh, there were many paths that could have avoided this. You collectively chose it for some reason. Okay, accept that. I don't know what the lesson of, of, of COVID-19 is. Um, I think that it could bring the world closer together. I think it could accelerate division. I think it could go in a lot of ways. I only know what my role as a teacher uh, and student and learner of peace uh, is, and what I assume all of yours is, and that is, yeah, let's not succumb to the fear, but let's not um, let's not make anyone else be wrong because they are in fear. Let's just. I often use the uh, metaphor of you know a nuclear reactor will spin out of will overheat and melt down if it doesn't have those lead rods in it that stabilize it. It's a crude metaphor, but I think of Course in Miracles students as sort of those lead rods that absorb the radiation and neutralize it so the whole thing doesn't overheat. You know, we can hold that peace for ourselves and for all of our brothers and sisters who are also ourselves, but, but don't know it. And when we do that, we're actually seeing them as, as ourselves as well. But I don't know what the final, you know, the final outcome is. Uh, I hope civilization doesn't melt down. Um, you know, revealing my political biases. I think that maybe something like this was necessary to pull the curtain back on the Wizard of Oz and show that uh, there's there was no there there, um, yeah. you know. <laughs> uh, but I don't know what the ultimate is. Well, we shall see and we shall see together. And does yes. anybody have any questions um, that they, or comments or anything that they want to leave here before, um, you know, just to have Someone asked people. me to hold my book up again, so uh, yeah. on, the, on the chat, so I'm going to do that. You know what? I'm going to hold them both up. How's that? <laughs> yes. So this is from Nevermind to Evermind. Um, I have to say, this one came through. This felt pretty guided. I, uh, I when I look at it now, as an author, you always kind of look at a book. I mean, you probably have had this experience too, Marie. You know, it's sort of like how did that come through me? I imagine it's like having a child, you know, wait a minute, you know, this, this, this 25 year old uh, was my, um, I, I, I really do think it does, uh, it accomplishes what I wanted. Um, I know that because my mother who was never into A Course in Miracles now tells me that she's reading my book every night and considers herself a course student, even though she's never cracked the book. <laughs> oh, that's a good litmus test right there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 If my kids then, ever read my books, then I'll know I did something right. <laughs> yeah, my, well, my kids haven't read my books. My son started it and said, hey, I really liked, uh, you know, the first page. <laughs> yeah. The other one is um, from, from, one, from loving one to one love, the idea being we start conceptualizing love as a one-on-one -on -one transaction, person to person, body to body. And the goal that the Course is teaching us is to use each relationship as what I like to call a crucible for enlightenment. Um, this is how we wake up. And as we do it more and more, the learning generalizes and your relationships actually become more and more similar. 
yeah. they're just there for love. Yeah, they're outer forms. You know, I'm doing different things with my kids than I am with my mother, than I am with, um, you know, my colleagues in the foundation. But that's okay. They all sort of the, the, the coloration and the, the templates that they are, they just get looser and more transparent and you start to realize, yeah, they're, they're, all, they're really all about love. Um, and so the book, sort of there are two parts. The first part is about special love. Uh, the second part is about grievances and uh, working with forgiveness around grievances. And um, there's some fun stuff in there. You know, I don't, when, when they first, this publishing company approached me and said, you know, would you be willing to take on this contract uh, to write five books? And at the time I, I was moving from New Jersey to California, climbing the real estate cliff. And I was like, you're going to give me how much of an advance? Oh yeah, I'll do that. Now I feel like I signed a contract for indentured servitude where, oh my God, I've only written two books. I've still got three more to go, uh, but it's good. It's Holy Spirit's way of forcing me to do um, my work. Um, so anyway, uh, I think that the book does have, I, I'm pleased with it. Uh, I can't just write the typical Bill and Helen did this and here's how you interpret it. Um, I, I, I want to share my own understanding and metaphors and occasionally bad puns uh, with people. Um, bad pun, for example, attack is always about lack. So let's think of attack as being at lack. You know, when you're attacking. Oh, right? That's a good one. That's a <laughs> thank key you. Thank at, you. Thank you. Thank you. At lack. Yeah. 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 I mean, we're attacking because we feel it lack and we want the other person to feel the same way. Um, the second book, From Loving One to One Love, goes into shame a great deal. Shame is one of uh, the things that Holy Spirit made sure I got a good training in and a lot of practice working with people. A Course in Miracles talks all about guilt, very little about shame. That's because Helen and Bill were in the psychoanalytic world of the 1960s and there was no talk of shame. There were no papers. There were maybe five or six. Shame didn't come into vogue until the 80s, but shame and guilt are sort of, you know, two evil twins of two sides of the same coin. So I talk a lot about that and how to work with that, um, but all within the greater, um, the greater embrace of A Course in Miracles. But uh, what I like doing best is this kind of discussion. So where I wanna bring it to a close is coming back to the Foundation for Inner Peace. Everyone knows we publish the course. Uh, we're one of a number of different publishers. Everyone knows we distribute the course. But in 1978, when the Foundation was given its function by the voice of Jesus that Helen heard, what it was told is your only job, your only function is to publish, distribute, and discuss A Course in Miracles. Hmm. I keyed on that word discuss. Because we all talk about teaching A Course in Miracles and being teachers, and there's this hierarchy of who knows and who doesn't. No, because um, the course is really clear. We're all teachers. We, you know, all you have to do to be a teacher is complete the workbook once. Um, and we're teaching what we need to learn, and we're learning what we teach. Uh, it, it's not really the right term, but we do need to discuss. And here's the beauty of it. You can't discuss it by yourself. It requires a relationship. <laughs> So we're doing the work of the course here today, uh, especially, I thank you for inviting me to this happy hour. You and I and everybody here, we're discussing in the crucible of a relationship and that's how we learn together. All our minds go, you know, work together in this. I learn, you learn, we all learn together. So I love that. We hope to have Dr. Bob come back again for another happy hour. Thank you guys all for showing up. Remember that a happy ending is guaranteed. I don't know why I'm called to say the Our Father, but I'm going to close with the Our Father just because it, because why not? But uh, because in the Our Father, it says like, give us this day our daily bread. Let yeah. us remember just to take this day our daily bread. So, so Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into our ego, but deliver us from it. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 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 God bless. Have a wonderful Amen. day. Keep it going. Thank you, Maureen. Party. <laughs>
Happy hour. <laughs> all right. God bless you guys. Have a great night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you. Love you. I love Hope you, you all. Bye bye. Bye.